Everybody hear me? It has the ability to activate itself. Well, in cardiac and smooth muscle, myosin requires an enzyme to phosphorylate it. And that is called myosin light chain kinase. MLCK. Now, why is this important? If I find troponin, tropomyosin, in the bloodstream, if I find myoglobin in the bloodstream, what is that clinically telling me, guys? If myoglobin is inside the muscle cell, and I'm finding myoglobin in the bloodstream, what is that telling you? The disease. It's called rhabdomyolysis. You get rhabdomyolysis from it over exercising. <laughs> Alright? You can damn me when I tell you, if you stretch too much, if you're that weekend warrior, you go out and you play and you hurt yourself, right? Because you didn't stretch enough, or you overstretch. You tear the muscle, and then what happens? The stuff starts leaking out. If I have enough of this protein myoglobin in the bloodstream, you know what happens? You get an acute kidney failure. Does it sound like a good thing? No. You see why it's important to keep stuff where it belongs? See why it's so important for skeletal muscle to keep myoglobin inside of it? All right. That myosin light chain kinase that I'm mentioning here, guys. Myosin light chain kinase is an enzyme that's going to phosphorylate myosin for smooth and cardiac muscle. Because why? Because uh, they can't do what skeletal muscle can do. Does that make sense? Skeletal muscle has its own ability to phosphorylate itself. Its myosin light chain has the ability to phosphorylate itself. This is myosin light chain. You got a light chain and a heavy chain. The light chain is connected to the heavy chain. The heavy chains is what make the end line. The light chains are what make the heads that reach up to grab back. You never got me? Any questions, guys? Any questions at all? That's the that's that's the review for muscle. Damn. Oh, we still got a half an hour. Any questions? None? Scares me. You guys know it all, or you know nothing. <laughs> That's how I look at it. You guys know it all, or you know nothing. I prefer that you, if you guys knew nothing, that you at least ask me some questions about what you don't know. Otherwise, I keep talking. <laughs> I, I keep talking. Just one question on the graph. Yes. Uh, which one would you refer to as the electrical and mechanical? Okay. Well, this is the electrical event for the deep. This is the electrical event that occurs everywhere on the membrane of the muscle cell, the sarcolemma. This this has to occur. You have to have you have to reach max at every little stretch of the sarcolemma until you get down to the T tubules and then down to where these these receptors that I told you I won't hold you responsible for. They're gonna open. You got me. They're going to open, and they're going to well, they're going to trigger this release of calcium. I won't test you on this. All right, I won't. I the, the book mentions them. They have them there. They mention them just once, just in passing. They don't even highlight them, but they're mentioned. And what they are are they're the actual plug and drain for the T tubule with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So if, if if that if that plug senses a change, senses that electrical wave of depolarization down the T tubules. Then the plug gets pulled, and then the sarcoplasm tissue drains the calcium into the cytoplasm. Doesn't drain it outside the cell; drains it into the cell. Everybody got me? It's been keeping it contained within the cell, but within the cell, as an extension of the outside world. And then when the cell says so, all right, now release it from the outside world. Now release it into my world. Go ahead and let it go. How do we get it back, guys? Does anybody know? The calcium is there. Can the calcium be there forever? Does everyone agree the calcium cannot be there forever? If it's there forever, then guess what? 
then uh, uncontrolled muscle contraction, yeah, it's not gonna work. I, I gotta I gotta pull the calcium back out again to then release it again. I mean, this is how muscle works. And so let me ask you a question. This is so if this is my sarcoplasmic reticulum and, and I have this really large calcium concentration in it, and it's inside a muscle cell. Right, that has a small amount of calcium. How the hell am I going to get that small amount of calcium back into that SR? Anybody? How am I going to get that back in there? Am I just going to open up a channel? It's going to flow out. If I, all right, here. If I put a channel in there, what direction is the calcium going to flow? Out. Does everyone agree? Can I have that? No. No. Does everyone agree? No. I can't have that. I need this calcium out of here. It cannot be here. I need it to go back in here, and then, if necessary, I'll release it again. You got me? So what am I going to do? Calcium. ATPase. Pump. It's going to actively pump calcium against its gradient, guys. Does that make sense? And I, hey, if I'm pumping something against this gradient, am I going to need energy? Yes. yes. So this calcium pump, you know what they call it? The circa pump. Look up circa, you'll see why. It has to do with the ER. That's what it has to do with the ER calcium pump. The sarcoplasmic ER calcium pump is what they call it. And it's... It's a calcium pump that you'll find on the SR that will literally take whatever calcium got released by these, these receptors when that voltage-gated signal came down the T-tubules. Immediately, it's like, oh, wait, 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 calcium, oh, no, get back here. So they're, they're kind of working, they're, they're working against each other. Did everyone see? Because why? Because we can't have the muscle in this contract the state with the release of calcium always. We have to remove it, and then if need be, we have to release it again. You got me? Can't always have it there forever, just like you can't have all the sodium there forever. Can't have all the potassium leave forever, right? Potassium's gotta come back, sodium's gotta leave, calcium's gotta go back where it belongs. You got me? Everything has to go back to normal, yeah? Before we can then do it again. This is amazing, isn't it? When you think about it, even when we're sleeping, our muscles are contracting. We're never relaxed. From the moment we are designed, from the end of eight weeks, we already have muscle tension. Until that last breath, we'll have muscle tension. Okay? Unless you have a stroke, God forbid, right? Then you'll have half the muscle tension. Because okay? they'll have to be you know, like my grandfather, right? Been taught, couldn't walk. Right? What kind of life is that? Questions on this? So that's the that's the first that's the first chapter of muscle. That's it. We're done. All right? Any other questions? Refer the textbook. Come back and see me if you have any other questions. Right? Come see me during my office hours. All right. Now, I'm gonna erase this. It is on video, so I do have it on video. All right. That disease, rhabdomyolysis, guys. Rhabdomyolysis. That's that's something that you should definitely look up because it is something that's common. That uh, there was a semi-famous uh, uh, female weightlifter that died not too long ago. Yeah, yeah. cute mini fit, renal fit. That could have been due to several things: the rhabdomyolysis and any any excess consumption of amino acids she may have been accumulating. Because when you get excess nitrogen accumulation with renal failure, you your brain swells. This is where you gotta be really careful about what you're consuming and how much you you know you're overloading your body with regularly. So one has to be very, very concerned. Yes. Well, you said that can be found in the bloodstream. So the rhabdomy the rhabdomyolysis is what it is. It's if you look at the word rhabdo. So rhabdo is the ripping of muscle, is what they're referring to. The ripping and lysis of muscle. And what that'll do is that'll cause leak. Leaking of myoglobin into blood. 
like on something they would find like if you go for a routine yeah like no routine if you're blood. showing mild human blood and then showing up in in kidney as well mm -hmm. like in urine then you got you got a serious issue on your hands. Like you're gonna go to renal failure. This myoglobin in the bloodstream does not belong there. It's supposed to be in skeletal muscle. So if this shows up, if this ever shows up on somebody's blood, you know, hey, either they, they they had a crushing injury, they got crushed by a car, they got run over by something, they they cut and damaged the muscle, or they're 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 like one of these OCD type people that go to the gym and they never leave the gym. And they're always working out, right? <laughs> you know, I'm sure you know somebody's like that. You see them, they're always lifting, always lifting, never give their body time to rest. That's dangerous too. That can lead to your death. Because if you destroy enough of this muscle cells and that myoglobin goes out, this can lead to acute kidney failure. So you guys see, like, it, we're not only, I'm only just one step away from showing you guys some of the clinical pathological aspects of what goes wrong when muscle goes bad, all right? Separately, don't forget we have what? Muscular dystrophy, MD, muscular dystrophy. That, that was another disease. There's several forms of muscular dystrophy. There's also uh, what they call glycogen storage diseases. So because muscle has the ability to store glycogen, yeah? If you don't have the enzyme that allows the muscle to take glucose and, and polymerize it into glycogen, or you don't have the enzyme that can break glycogen down into the glucose molecules when you need it, then you're gonna have either Pompe's or Von Gerke's, there's other diseases. These are called glycogen storage diseases. They prevent skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle from mobilizing glycogen or glucose, or they prevent the storage of glucose in the form of glycogen. Those are called glycogen storage diseases, though, also. So these other diseases called glycogen storage diseases, because muscle has this issue with, with uh, storing glycogen, sure enough, so does liver. So some of these, some of these people that have these diseases, there's a, a slew of them. Some only have it with skeletal muscle. Some will only have it with cardiac muscle. Some will have it with all the muscle. Some will have it with liver. Some will have it with all of them, including liver. Right? Well, why liver? Because well, the liver is responsible for also for storing glucose in the form of glycogen. Right? It's the way we store we store excess glucose, at least to some extent. Then everything else gets stored as fat. So it doesn't really matter what you eat. But I know I have issues with you know, people say is if you eat more than what you consume in a day, it doesn't matter what form you eat it in. It's going to get stored as fat. So you can just be eating protein all day. Right? And, and you, you burned 3,000 calories and you ate 3,001 calories. That one extra calorie is going to be stored as fat. Not as an amino acid, but as fat. All right? So that's just how the liver works. So muscular dystrophy is a huge one. Rhabdomyolysis is another one. Rhabdomyolysis could be, it could be an injury. It could be a crushing injury. I got, I got one day, I, got, I was working as a mechanic, okay? And, and I was over on 27th Avenue on the northwest side, and I was pushing the car up, up to get it up onto the concrete, and it was elevated. So sure enough, the car rolled back down, and my leg got stuck between the back rail of the truck, the tow truck, and the bumper of the car. And, you know, the, the years ago, this was, you know, most cars were steel bumpers, right? Not like this plastic bumper, styrofoam bumper kind of thing. So it, I got lucky that it didn't do any more, you know, it, it, it didn't, wasn't too far forward that it came back too, too hard on me, but I, I, you know, I had a bruise. And you can imagine, if it's enough of a crushing injury, not only do you damage the muscle, you damage the bone. You damage the bone, man, then you get the risk of fat leaking out. And the fat embolism along with what? Rhabdomyolysis, the leaking of myoglobin into the blood, which leads to acute renal failure. You see? It's dangerous, man, it's, and it's, it, Life is delicate. Life is so delicate, all right? So muscular dystrophy is that issue with that protein, the anchoring protein, right? The dystrophin, dystrophin and dystroglycan, they call it. Dish, dystroglycan, it's their anchors. Their cell anchors, their muscle cell anchors. Muscle cell anchors. They anchor what? Actin, actin to collagen. Oh, well, collagen is extracellular. 
and actin is intracellular. Oh, so that means that, that this dystrophin dystroglycan is a membrane bound protein. Now you see that? If I have bad dystrophin or bad dystroglycan or any one of the components that make this huge complex up, then I'm going to have some form of muscular dystrophy, which gives me what? Get a decrease in this. And I get muscle, an increase in muscle fatigue. And muscle weakness. Of course, stuff like ALS can give muscle weakness, can it? Polio can give muscle weakness, can it? Our, one of our presidents, anybody know what president? FDR. FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, one of the greatest presidents. You know, he served for 12 years. 12 years. The only president to serve 12 years. He was so popular, they were afraid he was going to serve another. They put, they put limit, term limits on it. Two, two terms, that's it. Because he was that popular. He came out with the New Deal. He was the one that took America out of, out of the Depression. And then actually took us into war. He didn't want to, but he had to. Um, so... He had polio. He suffered from polio. Did he have muscle weakness? Yeah. You didn't see it though, because why? Anytime you take a picture, he's standing next to a family member or he'd be using a cane. Very rarely you'd see him in a wheelchair. They didn't want to take a lot of pictures of him in a wheelchair. Really interesting. He tried a lot of different therapies to try and overcome his polio. Sure enough, you know how you get polio? What did I tell you? 50% of the time. Everybody ready? Uh huh. Gives a new gives a new definition of the word shit eater, don't it? <laughs> gives a new definition of the word shit eater, don't it? Fifty percent of all diseases that are that are given to humans by humans is from my my anus to your mouth, fecal oral route. The other fifty percent, my snot to your snot, or my snot to your skin. Uh huh. That's almost every disease that we acquire. Polio. Contaminated water. Contaminated water. That's where you got it. All right? So as we start working into the nerve, you're going to see I'm going to start talking about some of these other diseases that are more neural, but still have an effect on skeletons. Everybody cool with that? Any questions? Good stuff, good stuff, right? So glycogen storage diseases, why? Because of glycogen, muscular dystrophy, why? Because of the dystrophin, dystroglycan, ribomyosis, why? Because of the thinking of myoglobin. Guys, if I have problems with my mitochondria, would I have problems with my muscle? Does everyone agree? Yes. If I have problems, do I have mitochondria in my muscle? Everybody say yes. Yes, I've got lots of mitochondria in my muscle. So if I have a problem with my mitochondria, will I have problems with my muscle? Yes. Yes, absolutely. See that? Make sense? Of course it does. I'm not going to teach you any other way. Just not going to do it. I refuse to do it any other way. What stinks is, you guys don't take me for 28 <laughs> All right. All right. If you don't take me for 286, then it stinks, right? Because I'm prepping you for 286, right? For my 286. And I don't know about anybody else's 286. I'm prepping you for my 286. So. All right. So. Let's talk about first, let's talk about the muscles, the six muscles. The six extrinsic muscles to the eye. Now, does everyone agree that we have only three cranial nerves that are dedicated to sensation? Or pure sensation, special sensation. Does everyone agree? Smell. Yeah. Sight and sound. Forget about touch for now. Because touch, man, we got everywhere on our bodies. Alright? Taste, we only got here. Alright? So for the most part, we got three cranial nerves that are involved. Three cranial nerves that are involved in pure sensory, special sensory, and again, I, I, I don't want to deal with taste right now, but smell, olfactory one, 
Sight, olfactory, I mean uh, optic nerves, cranial nerve number two, and sound, cranial nerve number seven. Okay? So I'm going to write them up here. Cranial nerve one, cranial nerve two, and cranial nerve, uh, I apologize, not seven, eight. Which is the uh, olfactory, optic, and oculomotor. These are all purely sensory neurons. There's only 12 cranial nerves. So you already know three of the cranial nerves are purely sensory. That means they're only sending information back into the brain. You got me? Now we'll come back to that later. Because what does this have to do with the six extrinsic muscles of the eye? Because ah. there's a mnemonic. SO4, LR6, all the rest are three. What does that mean? Okay, so six extrinsic muscles to the eye. Everybody follow? And you can see, you can't see. Here's my eye. So we're talking about left eye, okay? So the left eyeball sits within these plates. So we call this the superior orbital plate. And if this is superior, guys, then what would this plate be? Inferior. Inferior. And this one, what do we call this one? Lateral orbital plate, and what do we call that one? Medial over a plate. Everybody understand that? So medial. Inferior. I know you guys are probably dreading like, oh my god, is he going back into bone? Seriously. Like, oh my god, this guy's crazy. Now watch. Watch why I did this. There's a muscle that comes from the superior orbital plate. And attaches to the eye. What do you think we're gonna call that muscle, guys? Superior, Superior rectus. Superior rectus. Superior rectus coming off the superior orbital plate. And if I have a superior rectus, it's gonna pull the eyeball up or elevate the eyeball. Then what's gonna happen? If I don't have a muscle to oppose it, what happens? If I don't have a muscle to oppose the eye, the muscle that's pulling the eye up, then the, eye, then the eye's moving up and it's staying up. Does everybody agree? Yeah. <laughs> you imagine walking around like that all day. People, it'd be like a social experiment. See how many people, like how many different people, would ask you the same question. What are you looking for? Okay. I'm waiting for God. Leave me alone. Okay. So, the next one, guys. If I have a superior, then I must have a inferior. And the inferior must be coming from the? The inferior orbital plate. Does everyone agree? Oh my gosh, it's so hard. Now, guys, if there's a medial plate or lateral plate, am I going to have muscles coming from there, too? And are they going to oppose each other? Oh, so that's four of the six right there. Everybody see? Yeah. Bless you. Look at that. My pretty drawing looks like shit. <laughs> but it's all good. Because it's my shit. All right? This is my crappy drawing. Y'all can do your own crappy drawings, right? So four to six, what are the other two? What are the other two? I got, I got, everyone agree? I got paired muscles that are working opposite each other. Everyone agree? If I'm gonna put another pair on there, then you better believe those pair better be doing what? The opposite of each other. Does everyone agree? That makes sense? 
If the other two pairs are doing opposite of each other, then the, opposite, then the third pair better be doing opposite of each other. Yes? So now watch. There's this one that comes from up here along this wall and then has its tendon hook across like that. So what are they going to call that one? They're going to call that, because it's at an oblique angle, and because it's superior, we're going to call it the superior oblique. And guys, if I have a superior oblique, then I must have a what? An inferior oblique. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, it's so hard. And the inferior oblique, sure enough, is coming from here, and it's attaching right there. So it comes from the floor, the inferior orbital plate. That's why they call it the inferior oblique. But its tendon inserts at an oblique angle. Just like the superior oblique at an oblique angle. So everybody watch. What happens if I shorten this muscle and, and I put this as the 12 o'clock position? What happens if I shorten the muscle? in the superior oblique. Anybody? What's going to happen? If, if this is my eyeball, what's going to happen? This is my eyeball. So here's my eyeball. What direction would I go if I shorten the muscle this way? There I see I'm going to short I'm going to turn it medially. They call that introrosion, introrosion or medial rotation of the eye. If my superior oblique does medial rotation of the eye, then what is my inferior oblique doing? The opposite. Everybody agree? Lateral rotation of the eye. Does everybody see that? Look at it. When it pulls, it's going to do what? It's going to bring the 12 o'clock in this direction. Versus this guy, when he pulls, it's going to bring the 12 o'clock in that direction. Does everybody see? Internal rotation or medial rotation. Versus lateral rotation. And then what did we say about the superior rectus versus the inferior rectus? This elevates the eye. This depresses the eye. Lateral, this abducts the eye. And if I abduct, then I have to adduct, A-D-U-C, A-D-D-U-C-T, adduct, adduct. Guys, when my one eye is abducting, what the hell is my other eye doing? When my one eyeball is abducting, what's my other eyeball doing? Adducting. Does everyone agree? If it didn't, then I wouldn't be able to track. I'd be one eye doing this, the other eye would be doing that. Huh? That doesn't work. We have binocular vision. That means both eyes have to focus on a point in front of our noses. Okay? Guys, if there's six extrinsic muscles of the eye, what does extrinsic mean? Outside the eye. Everyone agree? If there's muscles outside the eye, are there muscles inside the eye? Yeah. They're called? Intrinsic muscles of the eye. Would those muscles of the eye be voluntary or involuntary? What do you think? Involuntary. involuntary. Smooth muscle or cardiac muscle? Smooth. It's got to be smooth. It can't be cardiac. You don't agree? What smooth muscle is inside the eye that has something to do with the eye? Everybody knows this. Everybody knows it. They just don't know the connection. You see why I do what I do? When I shine light, ah, the iris. When I shine light into the eye, what does the iris do? It does what? If I shut the light off, what does the iris do? It dilates. If I shine too much light, it constricts. That constriction versus dilation, smooth muscle, intrinsic muscles of the eye. There's only three. There's the dilator, there's the sphincter, and then there's the one that's responsible for making the lens of your eye thicker or thinner. 
That's called the ciliary muscle. So those three muscles are inside the eye. Now watch, guys. Look. Let's go back. What do you think SO stands for? Superior oblique. Yes? Sulfate if it's chemistry. Okay? SO4, sulfate if it's chemistry. But we're not in chemistry. We're in having physiology. So what? So the superior oblique is innervated by cranial nerve number four. Everybody see that? And the lateral rectus is innervated by what? Cranial nerve number six. And all the rest are? Cranial nerve number three. So ready here? Superior oblique, cranial nerve six, I mean cranial nerve four, sorry. Lateral rectus, cranial nerve six, and all the others. Cranial nerve three, 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 three. Everybody see method to my madness? So now you know what? Six of the 12 cranial nerves. Because you know the first three were what? Sensory, purely sensory, one, two, and eight. And now you know what? Four, you know, three, four, and six. Because they're dedicated just for the eye. What? Now watch. Muscles of mastication. Cranial nerve five. Muscles of facial expression. Cranial nerve seven. There's only four muscles of mastication. This guy, the temporalis. This guy over here, the masseter. And two muscles they'll never be able to test you on because they're deep into the bottom of the skull, between the mandible and the skull. They're called the lateral and medial pterygoid muscles. Those are your muscles for chewing. Then the muscles of facial expression and everything else. The vicularis oculi, the vicularis oris, the bucinator, the zygomaticus. The one that depresses the angle of the, right? They call it the labi, labii depressor angularis, right? All those muscles, guys, are muscles of facial expression. They all have only one nerve, set of nerves, or cranial nerves in it. So now you got what? One, three, and eight, right? You got three, four, six, five, and seven. So you've already got, what, nine? Or close to almost all of them? Seven of the 12. So you're about about third, right? Almost, almost two thirds.